learning the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, believe me, so you know that you know, Pastor Kerry enjoys the Word of God, everything from Genesis to Revelation. But when you pick up the Word of God, how many know you don't start in Genesis? You start in John. And why? Because Jesus is the center of everything the Father does for us. So we don't know Jesus, we only know about Jesus, then we're missing out all the elements and the essences of God's presence in nature. Some would say, oh me. Oh, me. Amen. So back in the Old Testament, New Testament. How many here remember in Daniel, when Daniel prayed and fasted, the Israelites were captivated for 70 years and so he sought God sometimes seven times a day you know Lord deliver us when are you going to take care of us and God gave him visions and dreams right but it says in one particular fasting and prayer time he fasted and prayed 21 days and we know the story says the angel of the Lord battled with the prince of Persia which resisted bringing back the prayers you know and it took 21 days not for the prayer to be heard God heard it instantly but to battle it back into the earth can you tell me why it was like that because who owned the earth at that time it was under Satan's control because Adam sinned so the battle comes back 21 days but see folks what testament are you and I in here, I love to spend time with God because he shows me the New Testament interpretation of things. So listen to this. Did you know that we're supposed to go to the Father in that day, right? In the name of Jesus, right? And he, and he said to me, this was just yesterday. He says, tell my people that when they say Father in the name of Jesus, I'm not hearing their prayer in heaven. I'm watching their face in heaven because they're right up before my face. There isn't 21 days of giving you the answer. You're given the answer immediately. It's what you do with it and how you talk about it and how you believe it will cause the results or the delay. And I know y'all needed to hear that. Because I'm hearing good teachers, wonderful teachers, that just haven't got that revelation. When you say, Father, in the name of Jesus, you are hotlined right before God. God, the Holy Spirit, puts you into Christ. Christ walks you before the Lord, and you are standing in before God. There's no 21 days. You getting this? No 21 days. The delay comes on our end by us walking it out. Now, if you have, you're dealing with people who have to get in obedience with God, then there's going to be some delay. When you're dealing with corporations or they have a need to pass some kind of a permit or something, you're dealing with a lot of wills and stuff, that will delay. But as far as your answer, it says, when you pray, what? believe you received it and you shall have it Jesus was actually talking about what happens with us when we go before the throne of God how that we get it if it matches up with the word God says it's signed it's delivered to you but unless you're taught you can't have faith for that I'm telling you again unless somebody teaches you this you, you can't have faith for it it's there, but you might not know. It's kind of like, unless somebody teaches you how to drive, you can't get the blessings of driving. And Dave teach you how to ride a motorbike. Yay! You see? So, new creation realities. The reason why we also teach, because it's not being taught in a lot of churches, is we get our eyes off of who? World, ourselves, and other people. And what do you mean? I look at my wife every day. Is that other people? No. 
other people for taking your advice before taking it from God. When you look to people for your advice and your, and your pull and, and all for your physicians and your dental and all that, and you don't pray to God and you don't ask God to get involved, then you're trusting in the arm of flesh. And flesh can let us down. I don't know about you, but sometimes I get up in the morning and my arm lets me down because I fell asleep. <laughs> Come on, laugh with me. Pay attention. That can sit on a chair, sister. You don't need to run that back. <laughs> Where's mom on that? Anyway, so let's get into this. That, did you enjoy that little nugget? Yes. So there isn't any devils battling your prayers, folks. There's no devil battling the answer to your prayer. Why? Because you sealed it with the name of Jesus. You put fire right around that prayer. Satan couldn't touch it if he wanted to. Besides, did Satan listen to your prayers in the holy place of God? No. So he doesn't know what it is. He just sees a fireball going to God. And God says, granted. It's time we see the way God laid it out. Why was Jesus so confident in the middle of a storm? Because he knew the end. He knew how it was going to end up. Who takes us into all truth? Who guides us, declares all things that God has said to us? The Holy Spirit. And unless we get to meet with him and be with him, he's never going to show you the confidence that we have in Christ in the future because God has it in his hands. Say amen, somebody. Amen. All right, good morning to you. Today's lesson is called Before the Throne. Before the Throne. I think there's not enough teaching again, it's my opinion on heaven and what happens when we get before the throne so when we say father in Jesus name the Holy Spirit puts us in Christ so we're in the spirit realm because our father is a spirit and then Jesus who's been forgiven he's our righteousness he carries us up this is all in the spirit realm he carries us up and lays us out before the father and stands right next to us while we plead our cases Hello? No touchy from the devil -y. Hello? It is too hot for him to handle. But we don't get taught this. We don't get taught that. And that's why Satan keeps people from coming here. Because once you know the truth and you enact it and you act on it, you are totally free. It says, he that heareth my sayings and does them, I'll show you to whom he is like. He is like unto a wise man who built his house, everything they do say and build their life on, upon the rock. Who's our rock? And that foundation is so blessed, folks. He moves right with our feet everywhere we go. He told us in Joshua, every place your feet shall trod, I will be there. You shall claim it and it shall be yours. Now in the New Testament, who's dwelling in us? So we're taking God everywhere we go. Make sure we don't whack somebody with ourselves. Instead, let us bless somebody with God. Amen. Somebody yelling at you, just be quiet and gentle. And says, you know, you're just tormented because you're angry. But I sure love you. Get a chance, watch the cross and the switchblade. Because when D David Wilkinson said to Nicky Cruz, who had a switchblade in his hands, he says, you might cut me into pieces, but every one of those pieces is going to say, I love you and will give my life life for you and it just crushed them folks everyone knows when they're missing God we don't need to remind them if things are not working out for you and coming together there is some area you need to go before God and ask him what you need to work on say amen it's our responsibility to do that he's our physician isn't he and you know how us guys are we hate to go to uh, go to a doctor some girls too, you know. I don't like them, but I go. You know, don't be that way with God. Go with them every day and say, operate on me, fix me. So let's get into this lesson, shall we? All right, can I have a sip? So family, what a time to be alive in God. Now remember, this is the flashy, flashy, in time, things not going right in the earth, okay? All of this noise, all of this bad stuff that people are seeing 
is exactly what the Antichrist needs to come into power. Because remember, he's the false answer for the confusing state of the world. Now, folks, you and I are not going to be here. We are going to take the elevator out. <laughs> You say, well, how do you know that, Pastor Kerry? Well, it's just days of Noah, right? Days of Lot. What we keep focusing on is all the bad stuff that was going on in the days of Noah and the days of Lot. What we keep missing is what God wants us to focus on. He says, yours is not the time to know the, the seasons and all the end time stuff. Your job is to get the power and get to winning souls. So back, back to that when he says, look. Look, you don't be so caught up in what's happening around you. Be caught up in your relationship with me so I can empower you to be victorious in this time. Say amen. Folks, this is not the same time that we were in 10 years ago. Times have changed. The surroundings have changed. Satan is doing this and God is doing that. And there's a sifting going on. We are being sifted between goats and sheep. Goats are the ones that stay home, do their own thing, complain about everything, and sheep follow. And he separates the what from the what? It's happening now. So everybody thinks that's going to be at the end of the year. Yes, the major one is. But that's what God's doing right now. Which boat are you in? Are you the one that's sinking that says, Titanic, get out of the flesh? Or are you in the one that says, Jesus, you're sold out no matter what anything happens? You are sold out. He's the one that carries us out of here. You can't let go of him. Say amen. God is calling his children to draw closer, to seek him, and to know him. There's a lot of Christians that really don't know their father. Okay? And I'm not faulting anybody. I didn't get to know my father until I relaxed around him and opened up. I had a great dad. He was supported and everything like that. Not all of us have great dads. You see, that's why we don't use physical things to try to analyze God. Don't ever do that. It's really foolish. Because your dad was an abuser doesn't mean God is abuser. Well, I can't get to know God because I'm afraid of men. Get delivered. Because I don't care if, if a dog bites you, do you throw all the dogs away? Why do we do that with the church? You got bit at a church, so you never come back. It's the dumb, dumb stuff. And I'm not calling any of us dumb, dumb. It's the dumb stuff because it's self preservation. I don't want to be hurt again. Self preservation. God resists the. See, Satan's a master at twisting us up within ourselves. Thank God you're not that way. Amen. Go with me to Matthew chapter 11. God is calling us to him. You got a problem? Where do we go? To him. You got something that's not working out? Where do you go? To him. Do you go to Pastor Kerry? No. You go to him. Say amen. amen. I'm only a supplement. God is the dude. Amen. See, in the Old Testament, people didn't know how to get close to God. They couldn't get close to God. They had sometimes wondered if God even liked them. But see, they did not understand. But in the New Testament, we're to be taught the gospel. We're to be taught about our Father, about our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus even said, if you see me, watch me. Mimic me. Do everything you see me do. You're going to be seeing and enjoying the Father and the Holy Spirit. Because we're all one. Amen. So that's why I tell everybody, if you're a brand new Christian or you're coming back to the Lord and you somehow have had a confused image of God, go to John and look at everything Jesus says and everything Jesus said and fall back in love with him again. Say amen. And that involves saying, Lord, forgive me for running my life when you should be running it. And just be honest and let God cleanse all that stuff out of you. Say, oh, me. All right. So when you're troubled, when you're burdened, when you're, when you're, when you're, something is going wrong, where do you go, Tim? You go to God. Not the medicine cabinet. Go to God first. 
You don't go to the, the gossip page and tell everybody what you're planning. Nope. You go to God first. And then you talk with him until you get a peace. Here's what people do. They'll go in and talk with God and they'll get up before God can give them the peace they need. Say, oh, me. All right. So Matthew 11, it says, and God is calling us to, uh, to him. And it says, come unto me. This is Jesus talking. So you see the will of God in flesh doing the talking. So this is God talking also to us at this time. I'm going to read it rather quickly. Come unto me, all you that are, who labor and are heavy laden. That's just about all of us. And I will give you what? Rest. Rest. This also means time to play. Amen. Time to laugh. Amen. Time to sing. It doesn't mean so focused on God you can't breathe. No, it means for you to rest. When I go on vacation, one of the main themes is for us to get rest. When I come to God, my main theme of coming to God is for me to get. Are you unrested? Then you're not meeting with God enough. Don't get mad at me. Increase it just a little. Have God help you. Because I tell you what, you could be in, right in the middle of a huge storm and you could be at peace knowing God's going to take care of you. If it's so large, you can't do anything about it. Now, why are you so troubled about it? Put it in God's hands and have peace. This isn't a surprise you're going through this. He probably warned us not to go through this, but we didn't listen. We kept disobeying and not going to pray and not doing these things. And then when things began to break, we go, oh God, and then we get all upset about it. And we start hurting and wounding people. Irresponsible. Get with God. Let me ask you, how is your prayer life? Okay, don't, don't be nodding because some people hear it sucks. It's a terrible thing. Your prayer life is about you're giving a dime to God and you're expecting a hundred dollars. I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about in your time with God. You give a dime of time and you want a hundred buck return and he does it. Because he's God. But folks, if you're a young married couple or if you're a single person and you don't have a prayer life, you're not going to survive in the end times. It's going to get too bad. This is before the rapture. How much are we actually going to see, Pastor? What did you like to see last year and the year before? Did you like all that? Wasn't that good? While the church was in their foxhole, not praying. They're going, oh, what are we going to do? seeking to save their life now I'm a little bit upset with the church because we need to be killing the Goliaths and we need to be taking over the government and we need to be functioning the way God would have us run until he comes but the church too busy fighting amongst themselves digging in the holes and boy I tell you I can't receive correction so we're illiterate we're not legitimate we don't have a father he's not bothering us because we're doing our own thing all the time my word we need to be fathered God are you pleased with me and there was silence in the space of heaven now you know I'm not mad I just get all fired up about it because we're expected to be responsible okay not to continue to be irresponsible and to run all over the grace of God we're just not supposed to do it okay come on to me all you that are labor and a heavy burden and I will give you rest take my what yoke. most people don't understand a yoke it's kind of like being belted to God a yoke goes over the two oxen so that the younger oxen can learn what the older oxen knows so when the older oxen dies the younger one has it together Jesus is our older oxen and he's going to die and rise again but we're still yoked together with him let him walk you through life the way he has it for you not the way you think he wants it for you and so to do that you have to spend time with him and say Lord I yoke myself up with you today it's you and me it's you and me God you're taking the lead and I'm yoking up with you 
The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not. He maketh me to lay down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Because God not only is yoked to me, but he's in me. See, this is where the Christians are missing it. Generally speaking, I'm not saying everyone, but generally speaking, they miss the God inside. They're trying to appease God outside. We're walking from the outside in as Christians. No, 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 no. Walk from the inside out where God dwells. Then your steps will be sure. Then your vision will be clear. Then your mind will understand. And then God will begin to lift that curse off you. And you'll begin to have revelation, creativity. God begin to give you new ideas for your life and your future. Can you say amen? I just begun to preach. Let's get into this. I'd roll up my sleeves, but they're already rolled up. <laughs> then he says... Take my yoke upon you and learn from, it says, not learn about me. This is where Christians are learning about God. That's okay. But learn from me. Amen. See the word from me? God wants to teach you personally. Amen. But you've got to also do the other things so he can. Say amen. amen. God will not sit with a self-centered person. He'll stand back from him and just listen. Don't be self-centered. Don't think you're the know-it-all. Don't think you got the word for everybody. Because we all get that. If you got a word from the Lord, then he wants to give it. Give it as graceful and loving as you can. Folks, would to God that you didn't stay out there in the kitchen. Would to God that you come in here and pray at the services before they start. Eating is always here. Would to God that you pray when you're here in the morning, if you want to. And pray for the service and pray for our area revival break. We still have hospitals and clinics in Washington that perform abortions. Pray it out of here. Pray it to close. Come on, folks. I know I'm glad that your life is coming together. God did that. But he did it because you talked with him and you prayed with him. Don't forget about that. He holds it together all of our lives. Say amen. He says, learn from me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is what? My yoke is? When you follow Jesus, it is not hard. If you ever heard somebody say, oh, I'm really having a hard time following Jesus. What's the problem? Come on, pastors. Come on, leaders. What's their problem? They're not meeting with God. They're trying to do it for God. Look up at me. If you haven't met with God, don't try to do things for him. Meet with God and then do things with him. Do, 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 do. Sounds like I'm prideful. I'm really not. I had to learn all these things the hard way. You think I just discovered this one day? The only reason I know what I know is the time I spend with my God. Because he knows everything. You can be reading along in the scripture and God show you something that you read a hundred times and suddenly it's become real. That's the time you spend with God. So, we're going to cover these four areas. Those coming in. This, oh, my goodness. Isn't it good? <clears throat> All right, these four areas. We're going to learn what asking the Father in the name of Jesus is really all about. I let some leak out. Okay. Why would God say through Jesus, In that day you shall ask me nothing. But whatever you ask the Father in my name, that shall you what? Do. Now, asking comes out of the mouth. Hello? Hello. If you want something from your mom, you had to do what? Yes. From your dad. Yes. You didn't go to your mom and go, <laughs> are you picking up what I need? <laughs> Why do we do that as Christians? Come on, shake yourself and say, that's right, that's right. You know, when you're a person that is hard to correct, maybe you feel that you won, you've aged old enough that you can be stubborn. I want to tell you, no, you're just a baby to God. And you really need to learn God's ways. Folks, when we speak the word, we're establishing the covenant that Jesus already set. When we believe in our heart and then confess with our mouth, what happens? 
we're saved. God moves us right into salvation. It has nothing to do with thinking. That's called meditation. And we're supposed to meditate. But if you need things to change, you've got to declare the covenant in Jesus' name. So on that day, you shall ask me nothing. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he shall do it. Woo! Glory to God. All right. So asking the Father in Jesus' name, too, we're before the throne asking, seeking, and finding. Some people will say, I asked. That's all. No, the Bible says ask and keep on asking. Not for the same thing. <laughs> I said not for the same thing. You're asked, Lord, I would like my son to be saved. And Lord God, I put him on your altar. I ask all the spirits that are working and causing his life to be ruined. I bind them all up in Jesus' name. Lord, I release your angels because he's bound them. I release them now to minister to him day and night, day and night, day and night, day and night, day and night. Lord, to just hound him and hound him until he comes right with you. Thank you, Father. Now I put them on the shelf and I thank you for that job's done. Now, should I have to repay it? pray that every day? No. I, when, when he comes up, because I have a what I call a, a prayer round where I go through certain people and then I'll grand through other people and I do that so I can keep my memory going on it. And then when I come up to him again, I say, Lord, thank you that you've heard my prayers. Thank you that you're continuing to do that. And Lord, I'm going to maintain faith and trust in you. Hello? So, you keep on asking, but you do it differently. Lord, I thank you asking. Lord, I thank you. Now, we're moving right on. Let's get the next person. Hello? In this series, we're going to teach you how to claim somebody for Jesus, how to release God on them, and how for them to never escape until the very last minute they breathe their last breath. So, if you like to know how to begin to get God to, to beckon somebody like that, Stick around, we're going to talk about it today. All right, third thing that we're going to do is we're going to show you how important it is for us to be transformed in what we call face-to-face -face relationship. There is prayer and there is soaking face-to-face -face time. How many here don't know what I mean by face-to-face? -face? It means when I sit and talk to my wife, I'm not yelling at her down at the end of the hall. <laughs> like Daniel, God! And angels have to bring the answer. No. Father, in Jesus' name, I'm sitting face to face with God. Right there. And God is so pleasantly loving me and caring for me. Remember, God has to have an invitation, Tim. If you don't ask God to help, he cannot help. He can only gracefully protect you. We have not because we, we have not because we, and start asking because you haven't asked enough. And God's not, you're going to say, well, you're going to make God into a Santa Claus. God forbid. I don't have enough cookies. No. God already set himself up to give grace to us. The only thing that hinders what God wants to give us is our own selfishness and inability to repent. Repenting is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It means to realize you've done wrong and say, God, I'm sorry, and, and go the other way. You can say that the, the world doesn't have a repentant heart because every time you try to help somebody, they turn on you. And they're always trying to correct you. No, wait a minute, I'm trying to help you and you're biting my hand? See, the world doesn't need to be that. I'm talking about the world, not you, okay? All right, and finally, bringing the lost and the broken before God. Do you know how to do that? Somebody says, do we pray for the lost? Of course, you pray for all men. Amen. Everybody. And especially, if, like say you're just going through your routine, you're at the store and suddenly somebody, somebody's on your heart. Do you know how to pray? Capsulate them, place them before the altar of God and release the angels on them? If not, we should know how. Boy, you got secret weapons all coming out of your ears. You just don't know about them. Unless you're taught, how can we know? Unless we know, how can we have faith for? Hello? And so Satan's been working on the church for hundreds of years, trying to keep us in the dark. Trying to mix up Satan with God. 
You never know what God's going to do. He got you this far. <laughs> All right, I'm middle enough. All right, asking the Father in the name of Jesus. Let's look at a couple of scriptures. John 15, 15 through 17. I want you to let you know God shows you. He loves you. He wants to be with you. Verse 16 says, you did not choose me, but I have chose you. And then look, and appointed you that you should go forth and bear fruit. And that your fruit should be, should, should remain. Amen. <laughs> Amen. It's our fruit should re because who's our fruit? God. There you go. Amen. But if we don't do it in God, it's going to come to nothing. The scripture says that if it be of men, it will come to nothing. But if it be of God, leave it alone lest we get into trouble. Hello? So that's why we don't go around criticizing other ministries. I generally will say that maybe the church needs to, you know, do some, but I'm not going to say, well, the church up the speed. Because as I sow, so shall I. Very good, kids. We're all growing. John 16, look at this. Okay, and then he says, I command you to love one another. Then John 16, 23 and 24 says, and in that day, after Jesus rose from the dead and after the spirit of God came into the earth in the New Testament you will ask nothing in my name most assuredly I say to you whatever you ask the father in my name he will give it you Woo! didn't say anything about 21 days did it yep see we got to get New Testamentized even when we read the Old Testament he shall give it you. And it says, until now you shall ask nothing in my name. Ask and you shall receive that your joy may be. Yeah. Have you seen a lot of happy Christians lately? I see you guys are happy. That's because you're on the word. You're practicing the word. You're doing your best. But when people know they should be doing something, they're not doing it. You're going to see a lot of frowns. A lot of, and then there are things periodically that try to work itself into our life. A loss of a loved one or certain like that tries to get hold of us. But you know what? We belong to Jesus. And if you're like me, you meet with Jesus daily and he cleanses you daily. I don't want to be a stinking Christian. Hello? What do you mean? Never pray, never read the word, and walking around like the world. I thought you were saved. You know, come on. Come on. Don't let what you do nullify what you say. Because what you say started on the path of what you do. Yes. Have to think about that for a bit. All right. So, in that day shall ask me nothing. Most of say, if you ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. He takes you before the Father, doesn't he? And then he says, until now you shall ask nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be. That's the key. God wants you happy. God wants you full. Right? Can, can you imagine God says, look at my kids. They really look oppressed. <laughs> it's what we focus on. Say amen, somebody. Notice, we were chosen. God chose us first. Amen? To go forth and bring fruit that we do this by meeting with God first in prayer because he then fills us and we're able to be quite fruitful. To notice, we are to ask the Father in Jesus' name and it's a hotline. It's not an Old Testament prayer. It's a New Testament prayer. When you go for the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one for thine is thy kingdom and thy power and thy glory forever and then you finish it in Jesus name so really what you're seeing there is a model of stations our father which is in heaven before you pray address the father give him glory thy kingdom come Lord I acknowledge that your kingdom came at Pentecost your will be done on earth. Who are you going to use, God? Us. You're filling us, cleansing us, guiding us, and to go into the world to preach the good news to the, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. To the lost, you can be found. To the sick, you can be healed. To the oppressed, you can have a clear mind. 
That's what we're to preach, not talk about all what the devil's doing. Say, oh, my, oh, oh me. All right, so let's go look at our second point. Before the throne, what happens, Pastor Kerry, when we get before the throne? Well, depends on how alert you are. Okay, so let me describe it. I, I just want to talk you through it. But get a mental picture of this, okay? Let's set our mind on things above. Where are we now? If you're saved, where does the Bible say we're seated? In heavenly places. We're also seated here physically. But our mind's supposed to be on things of... Uh, not on things of of the earth. So what happens is when we say Father in the name of Jesus, we need to see a picture of what actually happens so that we can enjoy all that he does for us while we're in his presence. How many here would like to see a picture of that? I wish I could put it on the board here and kind of shoot it out to you, but I can't really do that. One day maybe. I love those big churches that have can pop an illustration right up there. Joseph Prince, that's a good one. And a bunch of them, they have all of those. We don't quite have that yet. No, I said yet. Anyway, so what happens? So when you say Father in the name of Jesus, immediately the Holy Spirit sprinkles you with the blood of Christ, puts you into Christ. Listen to me carefully. I don't know if I'll be able to repeat this. And then Jesus walks you before the Father all in a millisecond. So when you go before the Father, you already are clean. So you don't come before the Father and say, I'm unworthy. I'm a nasty child of God. The Father doesn't want to hear that about his son. He already knows what you're capable of. So we go before the Lord. First thing that God does is he finishes our cleansing because we're in his presence. And if you were able to let things go, you'll feel a refreshing and a rejuvenation will happen. Then that's to get you to open up and begin to say, Father, I want to let you know I love you and I appreciate you. I ask for you to get, begin to fix in me. Everyone say, fix in me. Adjust in me everything that's broken. Now, folks, you don't know everything that's broken in you. But people have been trying to tell you. <laughs> laugh with me I'm just people do try to tell you a lot of times it's broken maybe they've noticed it or not but anyway you you have to give God invitation to change you if you don't say God fix me and adjust me then you'll stay the same because we only grow where let's see if you know this now where do we only grow I can hear you guys on on the yeah yeah you're right we only go grow in the presence of God you should know that like the back of your hand it's the time with God that grows us up he's spirit and we're spirit you can't do things physically and make spiritual things grow come on now you have to go to the one who grows spiritual things the parent of all things that's good. So we go in there now. You've got to see that you have God in you, a complete God package. I want you to know this is, helps us to understand. It's more than that. And every time you go to God, he unwraps a part of that package and God begins to develop in you until the day star arises in your heart, until Christ be formed in you, that we grow up into him who is the head of all principality and power. That growth happens with him. That's why Satan is working so hard to keep you from praying. You pray, and bless your heart, and especially when we're all around and I'm talking about praying. Everybody's nodding and doing that, but God knows. Your growth will show. Now, here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying spend hours in prayer. I'm saying give God at least enough quality time to cover the things in your heart that you need for the day. To cleanse you, fill you, and then clothe you. Okay, so now... I'm bringing God to God. Your God in my heart to God because it's a seed. It's like seed form. And because that seed's in us and we listen to that seed, 
it will lead us from sinning. It will keep us from doing stupid things. That's God in you. So we bring it to God, we bring him to God, and we talk to him. And God develops inside of us. If that doesn't happen and you don't have a prayer life, your flesh will become religious. Come on now, in order to get along with people, sometimes you've got to have the same jargon as them. Doesn't mean you've, your life has changed. But you say, you say the same Christianese stuff and all that kind of stuff, yet you're a carnal, fatherless, lonely child that doesn't have a prayer life. And don't get mad at me. Get a prayer life. Get a life. Hello. That's the way it's going to happen. Now, you know I love you, right? You know I love you. And here, somebody's sitting here saying, yeah, I wish so-and-so would hear this. No, you need to hear this. Let them see your life reflecting this. Say amen. amen. All this is all good stuff. Lynn and I made, made a pact a long time ago with God that we would do nothing on the end of our last of our lives uh, other than to give you information that's going to be good for your personal walk with God. I'm not here to build a church or to have a big edifice or have my name be famous or hobnob around all the big guys. Nope. I want to give you what you need, and then when I stand before the Lord, I want the Lord to be able to say to me, you did well, son. You didn't do perfect, but you did well. You gave of your heart, and you were no respecter of persons. I want to hear good things like that, and I want to start now. I don't want to wait and see and be surprised with it at the end, because we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, to give an account of the things we've done in the body, whether they be good or whether they be bad. And that's not sin. I, I've done some good teaching. I get that lesson. All right. So when we're before the throne, he starts fixing on us. Stay long enough for him to adjust. It only takes a minute. Sometimes you can sense it. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes you're just a blubber of, of tears. You're crying and everything. Don't try to stop that. Let it go. Why? Because God is reshaping your soul. And you've got to cry. And you have to relief release that that's good don't be macho man <coughs> hold it in go to one of those chick flicks you know you can see all the macho man <coughs> holding back to tears and come on god needs that softness remember you're a wine bag don't don't get mad at me god needs you to be able to expand and contract and and move with his spirit and that's where we get that beautiful, it's like a dance, folks. It's like you're dancing with God as a partner. And you're dancing with him. Do you understand what I'm saying? And you and him are, are moving. And if necessary, stand on his feet and let him move you around. <laughs> Come on, nobody's getting any of it. You're not dancing with the Lord like you need. Dance with him. Amen. Be with him. Yes. Court him. And then Miriam, because that's what the disciples did way back then, and a lot of them were sawed in half and killed. I only know of one disciple that lived his life all the way through, and his name is John, and he had the closest relationship of all of them. Amen. How close are you to with God? You can dance with him. Besides getting in this throne room, then he fills us after he makes all the adjustments so that we leak out on ourselves all the way. And then he fills us. We're a vessel. And just get filled. Just takes a little bit, a little couple of minutes. Oh, Lord, fill me. Bless you, Lord, fill me. Then he clothes you with Jesus' robes of righteousness, puts the armor of light down there. You don't put any of those things on. They're spiritual. Then he clothes you with the armor of light, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. As it is written, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I call the throne room God's dressing room. Because that's where we get addressed and dressed before God. Amen? I don't know about you, but I don't want to walk around as a Christian with holy jeans. And I'm not referring to... I'm talking about a holy lifestyle, which is not set apart for God. It's just loose, sloppy, goppy stuff. The idea behind that is when you're walking and being with God, he's your first love. You know, and everybody else is second. My wife knows that God stands between us, holding us together. If she ever does anything or I ever do anything to cause that to change, out of here. You become a problem. 
Now, I, I'm not talking about divorce or anything, but here's the thing. Let God be the center. All right, let's go on. How many here know that when we're in all of that, once we get up from the presence of God and walk into the day, aren't we equipped? Yes. Amen. Who does Satan see? He sees Jesus. Until we open our mouth and say something contrary. And we don't mean to, but we're just learning. Right? Every idle word. And so it happens to the armor. Well, you're so bright. You look like, I mean, Satan has to wear sunglasses or run. But as you go through your day, you make a comment and you get upset and you start to, and the, the armor brightness gets dimmer. And then you get mad at your husband or your wife and, well, you know, I'm just throwing out things. Or you're frustrated about something and dimmer, dimmer. Now, here's us illustrious Christians. Why don't we stop, pray, and get it brighter? No, we'll just get it dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. Not say, Lord, I blew it on that one. And, and keep fellowshipping with God so he keeps you bright. We don't. We have be spasmodic, come visit, help me out of this kind of thing, you know. And I mean, I'm, again, I'm not, I'm not trying to make any of us feel bad. I'm trying to get us to analyze ourselves before God so that we can stop the ludicrousy, the nuts stuff. Come on now. Amen. It just doesn't make any sense for us to live the way we're living and be Christians. Now, I'm not saying you're sinning, but you're not going to God. You're not saying, correct me, make me better. Now, let me ask you, you can actually, you know, I'm not afraid of what you're going to say, but you can go back a year and look at the way I preached to now, and you can see I've improved, but I had nothing to do with it. I go to God, change me, make me better. I want to be a better husband. I want to be a better father, better grandfather, better pastor for a congregation. These are your children, Lord, and I want them to be able to hear what you have to tell them and encourage them along the way. Amen. That's all I want to be. I already became famous. Everybody thinks I'm dropping names and stuff like that when I talk about the people I preached with and been with and all that. That's not name dropping. I want to tell you I did that. It was wonderful, but now you are more important than who I hang around. Do you understand that? You are more important than who I used to hang around with. So, I'm not going to let up some kind of wolf come in and chew you up. And I'm, I'm interested in that you're praying and you're doing the right thing so that you are t protected. Amen. Say amen. Okay. <clears throat> So have you got the idea how important it is to meet God before the throne? I hope, you, I hope you know it now. Okay. If you don't know to meet with God daily before the throne, then you will not grow exponentially the way God wants you to grow because there's not much time left. I asked my pastor, how much time do you think was left? He only told me 10 years. And that, I've been in the ministry 40 some odd years. I don't know. Right? So how short do you think it's now? I, I tell you it's getting shorter, but I can't really tell you. The key is to be ready every day. And if I tell you to meet with God and you just do that, you are ready every day. Oh, that's taken care of. You're adjusted. You're fixed. You're, you're, you're ready for your day. But if you don't do that, Satan eventually, you know, he holds grudges. Hello? Let me share this with you. This will help maybe sober up us. Satan holds grudges. So if you punched him and then you backed off, he's going to punch you. You cannot back off of the devil. You just simply crush him. And Jesus was manifested to destroy the works of the what? The devil. Who lives in you? So you need to fight with God and crush him every time he tries to mess with you. When you crush him, let's say, if you came around, let's say you're a, you're a bully and you came around. I had a bully do this to me. First time he hung me up on the lockers and I swung from my belt, because I was a little guy at that time, on the locker and the bell rang. Second time he tried to grab my hand, put it in a swirly, you know what I mean? We won't go into detail. And then God, I don't know if it was God or what, but then I got the idea, this is element of surprise. 
element of surprise. So the next time he tried to do that, I hit him where it counts. I leveled him and I made him so embarrassed and then I dragged him out into the hall. This is a senior, big, burly football player. He didn't think I had it in me. He thought I was a wimp. Listen, Satan sometimes doesn't think you have it in you. To stand up and be who God made you to be. Like the Israelites during the time of David and Goliath. They were all in foxholes, hiding. Here comes little David who believes God. And said, so I brought you your lunch. Go home, David. Can't you see there's a problem on the horizon? He says, he's no problem for God. See, everybody forgets who's in you, who's fighting for you. You think you're doing it all yourself and you have to come up with the wisdom and all that and everything like, no, you need to repent and get on your knees. Then you've already won. Repent just means turn around. If it's not working, make some adjustments. Who does that for us? Okay. Then we'll go to the next one. We're transformed when we look to him face to face. What image are we transformed into? His. His. His image. Why? Because we're focusing on his image. Let me give you a couple of scriptures. 2 Corinthians 3.18. You can see them here, I think, yeah. 14 and 18 in Matthew 6, 6, okay. What that tells us is, okay, when we meet with God, we're transformed. When we meet with God, we're transformed. Amen. Into what? A tougher Christian or more like Christ? Yeah. And what's Satan afraid of? Yeah, he's afraid of you being like Christ. He's not afraid of you. He knows your personality. He knows how to tempt you. But you're dead. Your life is hidden with Christ and God. And the life we now live, we live in Christ, through Christ, and for Christ. All right. So we're transformed. Say amen. amen. I like what it says. In, uh, in verse 14, but we all with an unveiled face, that should be verse 18, as beholding in a glass are changed into the same image from what? Glory to, yeah. So what does Satan try to get us to not focus on? God, because he says, well, if you focus on God, he's going to chew you out for all the things you did. He's going to correct you. Here's the guilt. God doesn't give any guilt. You're his kid. If anything, he removes it. But he can't remove it if we won't let go of it. So we go in there, he removes all of that, and he says, now listen, you're forgetting that I'm standing with you. You're forgetting your covenant. You're forgetting I already whipped the devil and made a show of him publicly. And that's what you need to be lifting up, and not yourself, how tough you are, and how can you can quote the scripture. You need to be lifting me up in your life, and he will run from you. As it is written in James, draw near to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. It means run in terror. Yes. Because you turned into a Jesus person instantly. You went from physical, boom, into spiritual, and he sees Christ. Well, Pastor Kerry, the devil tempted Jesus. Yeah, but how many other temptations do you see him doing to Jesus after he kicked his, his booty? Huh? Listen, if ever, the devil comes to you and every time you turn into a Jesus person and you just kick him down the street, how many times do you think he's going to keep returning in that area? He's not. He's going to try to find another opening you have. He walks about seeking who may, may devour. Here's something God showed me this morning in my revelations with him. He says, you know where it says in Job, when Satan was accusing Job, and he went up before Job, and he says, and he says you know, I'd like to get at your, your servant Job, but you've got a hedge around him. We missed that. Everybody that's born has a protective hedge around them. Yeah. It's not till they get older and rip it down themselves that we need to be born again and get protection again. Your prayer life builds your hedge about you. So Nehemiah, rise up. <laughs> when you pray, God builds a hedge around you. And the more you pray, the bigger the hedge. Yeah. Pretty soon you'll have Jericho walls all around you. But see, we are not consistent 
we're again flood bagging. The floods come and get the sandbags. Let's get our intercessors. They should have been already going. Would to God you would come in and early and pray for revival. Anyway, so everyone take a breath. I'm almost done with you. I sure love you. How many here are enjoying this? Remember who you are. Not that you're trying to be that way. Satan's always got us trying to live up to God. No, live with God and he'll bring you up. <laughs> Just a small understanding change. Hello. How many times, you can go back, and, and, and I know Scott remembers us seeing this, and maybe some of you. You, you go back 20 years, and everybody was talking about burnout. Remember? I'm burning out, I'm burning out. Do you know what the problem was? They were doing it for God. God wasn't doing it through them. Did you hear that? Did you get that? They were doing it for God instead of allowing God to do it through them. What happened is they ran out of energy. They burn out. You see, all the energy I run on is God. And when the anointing weans and everything, you'll see me, I'll sit down and I'm, I'm rang down a little. Then I'll get a rejuvenation, go and give God all the glory and all the praise, and he'll fill me back up, and I'll enjoy a meal with you. <laughs> you see, understanding the things of how God works is very important. Then finally, praying for the lost and the brokenhearted. Folks, when you're praying for somebody, first you need to, to start somewhere, and you need to finish in your prayers. So one day I was sitting at uh, Bailey's... Uh, what is it? Physical gym back in the olden days, 20, 30 years ago. And I'm sitting in the hot sauna, you know, where it's hot and there's no water and you throw some steam on it. And I'm watching all of these people, all the lonely people. Where do they all come from? You know? And I'm going, Lord, there's so many people. Lord, what do we do? And he says, did you know you could claim them? And you can put them on my throne or on my altar and I will work with them all their life until finally at their last breath. If they don't receive me, then that's their fault. But if they do, it's because you prayed and asked me to come and follow them and work in their lives. Now, do you think you can do that? You better believe you can. So you, you say, John Doe, Father, that man over there, I don't know his name. So I'm showing you some examples, but you know who that is. And Lord, I claim, their, I claim their salvation in Jesus' name. As it is written, you want everyone to be saved, none to perish. So now I ask that their angels, probably that they have bound because of a sinful life. I ask for forgiveness. I ask you to forgive them long enough and give them grace long enough for their angels to be active. For, and then I bind up the devil in his assignment to destroy their life. And I remove them, never to return again. And then I release the angels to minister every day to their life and their dreams and their visions all the way up until they make that decision and then on as they grow in the Lord. Do you think you can do that? So some of you, the which are more bound to house and can't get out around, there's somebody, all of a sudden you see somebody, something is going on. And you say, oh gosh, that needs to change. Then you, you tell God, God, you see what we're doing? We're meeting in the kitchen instead of up here in prayer. And Lord, I'm asking you to help me to pray. And now you're bringing God invitation to an area that needs to be adjusted without meddling. Hello. I don't like to meddle. You get bit when you're meddling people's lives. I like to bring God in the situation. Amen. So when you're praying, and I'm, I'm, a couple more words and we're done. When we're praying, what actually is happening, Pastor Kerry? Well, you're bringing God in their life through prayers. You're inviting God on behalf of someone else or something else in invitation of prayer. Say amen. amen. But you're also bringing someone before the Lord in your prayer. So you're bringing God to them and them to God in prayer. It's the most beautiful expression of compassion and love is to pray for others' souls and other people's brokenness. Well, if you got something out of that this morning, we give the Lord a praise. Amen.